un I'm going to use the word ignorance. Ignorance doesn't mean stupidity. Stupidity means someone is stupid, has low mental capacity. Ignorance just means they haven't learned. All right. And tenants tend to be ignorant. They have not learned the rules. Some of them have a really well. Some have not. So if they come to you and go, hey, I want to rewrite a new lease and it's just a renewal, they may put a new clause in and try and slide it by. If the tenant signs it, they should have read the lease. All right. The term of the lease is stated inside of the um, lease itself. And that is where you would put the defined end or if it's a period to period, that's where you would put that clause in there. Now, the next word is called security deposit. Security deposit is money the tenant places to the landlord to prevent or protect the landlord from being harmed, financially harmed. All right. When the tenant moves out, if the property is in substantially the same condition, less normal wear and tear, the tenant would get their security deposit back. If the landlord feels he is harmed in the form of, you damaged my property and I have to repair it, or you moved out owing me a month's rent, that is still called harm. I'm still financially harmed. I might have a case to claim your security deposit to become my money. So security deposit is deposited by the tenant held by the landlord to protect the landlord from any kind of financial harm, which could include physical damage to the property and or lost rent if the tenant vacated early. Now, here's the cool thing about security deposit. It is unlike earnest money in respect to this. Security deposits can be commingled inside of my personal bank account. Not a wise business decision, but certainly doesn't violate any administrative rules like the earnest money account does. So understand those are two different forms of money. Earnest money remains a client's credit and must be kept in a separate bank account segregated from my personal account. Earnest uh, security deposit is not required to be segregated. I can take your earnest, uh, your, I keep doing it, I'm sorry. I can take your security deposit today and go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse tonight by putting it in my bank account and using it. It's not a wise business decision because I still am liable for returning it to you should you move out under the conditions you're supposed to with no damage, but it is not a requirement. All right, thumbs up. Now, under the improvement section, you will start, this is the first chapter that we are going to start to see a split in residential and commercial real estate. Here is where our first split starts to happen. Improvements typically in the residential world are made by the landlord. I don't trust the tenant to install a new light socket or a new light switch. So I, as the landlord, will hire somebody to go in and make that improvement. 
And remember, an improvement is any man-made item. However, in the commercial leasing space, improvements are typically made by the tenant themselves. Matter of fact, you hear the slang word TI, meaning tenant improvement. Because in the commercial, let's say a commercial strip center, Subway has a different build out than a bookstore would. Bookstores got shelves and desks for everybody to read, or Subway may have deli trays and ovens and things like that. The landlord doesn't want to become responsible, so they push that onto the tenant and call it tenant improvement. Now, I know my joke here that I can't really use because we are in our seclusion zone is in the school, if you remember seeing the wall that sever segregated the office from the actual classroom, I built that wall. I put that in. That was a tenant improvement because I wanted that room to be one big classroom and then have some office space back there. So the landlord allowed that to me. I had to show him the blueprints and tell him how I did it to make sure everything was copacetic. But I put that wall in. And when I say I, I literally mean I hired it out to somebody. <laughs> All right. When I was responsible, I wrote the check. So this is the first divergence between commercial and residential. Now, accessibility. We have to be accessible to all of the handicapped people. So let me ask you a question. I've got a residential property, single family home. A gentleman comes to me in a wheelchair and says, Raymond, I want to live in your property. And he has a job and he has the down payment and he's got a decent credit score. And I look at him and say, sorry, I'm not renting to you because you're in a wheelchair. Can I do that? Well, that feels wrong, doesn't it? Unfortunately, I can. All right. You will see when we get to the fair housing chapter, all seven protected classes, there is at least one exemption for every one of the protected classes except race. Never an exception for race. But for the handicap, there is what we call an economic uh, challenge for me. I literally can say, I'm sorry, I cannot afford to build a ramp to the front door. I can't afford to lower the desks, put grab bars in the bathroom, things of that nature. So in the handicap arena, so to speak, there is an exception and it's called the financial uh, constraints. I have the ability to say, sorry, I would love to rent to you, but I literally don't have $5,000 to make my house accessible. Hold on, we're not done. If, and this is true in all the other cases, if that gentleman removes that economic burden by saying, I will pay for it, then I cannot he has removed my burden. So now I cannot do it. So what I'm saying is I am not not renting to him because he's in a wheelchair. I am not renting to him because I don't have the financial capability to make the house handicap accessible. If he removes that burden by saying, hey, I will pay for the ramp. I will pay for to have the, because my mom lives next door, I really want to be here. Then I can say, okay, we can do that. So I actually have the ability to say no based upon an economic burden that I can't afford. I had a guy, uh, a, a blind gentleman with a dog, 
And I remember he came into there and he had the dog and he started swinging the dog around. I'm like, what the heck? He's like, oh, I'm just looking around. Really? Come on. He told me, he told me, he said he used to skydive, but had to quit because it kept scaring the hell out of the dog. So, yes, <clears throat> and you will see when we get to that chapter that there are ways or there are specific conditions that allow me to, and I don't want to use the word discriminate because it's not, there are conditions that allow me to not follow the fair housing and under the handicap or the assess accessibility would be this one. I financially cannot afford it. If that person removes that burden by saying, I'll pay for it, now I, then fine, I can do that. Question. So what if you say that you can't afford it and then, um, but you really can, you just don't want to, can they sue you for that? Sure. Okay. Just curious. I am not a practicing attorney. Yeah. Hold on, Cameron. But literally, yes. If you went to Ted Turner, who owns TBS, and he says, I can't afford to put that ramp up, you probably have a solid case of going to the Fair Housing Commission and going, dude, I think the guy's lying. And then I want to uh, uh, start a case. They would probably call me and go, hey, we got a problem. Can you really? Oh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I guess I can. But yeah, a person theoretically could lie. Um, and they could be called on it. And if the, the judge found that they were in fact lying, then they could be guilty of violating the fair housing. Okay. All right. But let's assume for the moment it is a legitimate claim. I cannot spend the money to do that. All right. Now, Cameron. Okay. So when the disabled person comes and loses your thing, they said they'll pay for everything to be installed. When they leave, is it their responsibility to take all that stuff out or is that like? Yes, you can actually charge a higher deposit because they have to, in essence, put that house back in the original condition. But remember what security deposit truly is. If that tenant puts that house back, then they're going to get all their earnest money. But yeah, you might be able to say, I, I didn't want a ramp, you paid for it. You have now terminated your lease. We've went our separate ways amicably. When you leave, I want that house, that ramp taken back out. And if you don't, I've got enough security deposit to cover that. All right. Maintenance over on the next page. This is another one where you start to see the split. In the residential world, most of the time, landlords will do the maintenance. And if it's not, it would be defined in the lease. For instance, lawn mowing could be considered maintenance. You may push that on the tenant, that the tenant mows the lawn. But I'm going to work on the windows and the uh, roof. In the commercial world, ma the maintenance may be entirely done by the tenant. If a property gets destroyed or altered, the landlord should, out of respect, alter the lease to include that. Now, if the property gets completely destroyed, there have been court cases going both ways as to whether that terminates the contract on the lease. I'm here to tell you that most assuredly probably will not terminate a lease. Now, if let's say one bedroom gets damaged. I know uh, I had an investor client where the tree fell on the house and crushed one of the corners of the house and damaged the bedroom to the point where it was beyond use. So during the time frame when she had people coming in to fix the, the roof and reframe and do all of that, she lowered the rent and she said, okay, well, it was a four bedroom. It's now a three bedroom. I will deduct 25% because you lost a bedroom. All right. So they agreed to alter the